Tonight, after days of searching, the wreckage is found. An ROV, a remote operated vehicle, from the vessel Horizon Arctic discovered the tail cone of the Titan submersible. The tragic ending tonight after officials issued their condolences to the family members of the five who perished 12,000 feet below sea level. The details behind the search and recovery of the imploded Titanic tour vessel up ahead. Prolific film director James Cameron with us for more. Plus. This is what you've called a slaughterless house. Oh, yes. So you're making meat in here. Yes. But I don't see any animals and I don't see any animal parts. <laughs> well, that's the trick, right? We take you inside the facilities where a new age of lab-grown meat is being created. But will Americans eat it in big enough numbers to help fight off climate change? And people used to jump on a mic before she get on the mic because when she get on it, it's over. She shut the whole club down. It's over. New Orleans bounce music has been part of the hip hop scene for years. Tonight, we bring you the story of one of the genre's unsung heroes, Magnolia Shorty, who's been sampled by many but rarely highlighted until now. Good evening. I'm Phil Lipoff in for Lindsay Davis tonight. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We are following those stories and, of course, much more, including the severe weather and triple digit heat wave in parts of the country raising health concerns tonight. Plus, the latest court appearance for detained Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gerskovich and what a Russian judge decided about his case. The astronomical rise in e-cigarette usage over the course of just two years, the revealing numbers released today. Our correspondents are fanned out covering those stories and more for us tonight. But we are going to begin with that grim discovery near the wreckage of the Titanic, a, a tragic end to the story that has captivated the world all week. The Coast Guard announcing today pieces of the Titan submersible have been found near the wreckage of the Titanic, and the five aboard were likely lost in a catastrophic implosion. The families of the passengers were immediately informed their loved ones were presumed dead. It ended a days-long search where rescuers and the world had held out hope. We did learn late today the Navy heard the sound of the that implosion on Sunday. Tonight, we are mourning the five souls lost as many questions remain about the design of the Titan and the safety concerns some raised about that submersible. We are set to speak with explorer Robert Ballard, who was on the expedition in 1985 that actually discovered the Titanic wreckage, and famed movie maker and explorer James Cameron, who has visited that site dozens of times. First, though, Gio Benitez leads us off again tonight from Halifax, Nova Scotia. Tonight, a heartbreaking end. The Coast Guard announcing search crews have found the pieces of the missing sub carrying five passengers 1,600 feet, nearly a third of a mile from the bow of the Titanic. This is a incredibly unforgiving uh, environment down there uh, on the seafloor. Uh, and uh, the debris is consistent with a catastrophic uh, implosion of uh, the vessel. Five major pieces of debris were recovered on the ocean floor, including the sub's nose cone, as well as the front and back end of the vessel, all coming apart as the capsule collapsed inward under extreme pressure. It's unclear exactly when the sub imploded after it started its dive Sunday morning. The Navy now saying an underwater acoustic detection system heard what was likely the implosion of the Titan on Sunday. The information was immediately shared with the Coast Guard for analysis. On behalf of the United States Coast Guard and the entire Unified Command, I offer my deepest condolences to the families. Ocean Gate Expeditions tonight saying our hearts are with these five souls and every member of their families during this tragic time. We grieve the loss of life and joy they brought to everyone they knew. Businessman Shazada Dawood and his 19-year-old son Suleiman, who shared a passion for science and discovery. British billionaire and explorer Hamish Harding, who loved adventure. <laughs> Voyaging to space aboard a Blue Origin flight. I've always wanted to do this, and the, the sheer experience of looking out of the window is something I'm looking forward to. And setting records, diving to the world's deepest waters in the Pacific. Well, it's been a fantastic dive. Tonight, Harding's family remembering him as a loving husband and dedicated father, calling him a passionate explorer, whatever the terrain, who lived for his family, his business, and for the next adventure. P.H. Narjulet, a legendary expert on the Titanic, had been to the wreck more than 30 times since it was discovered. His daughter today saying there is comfort in knowing he was in the place he so loved. 
and the CEO and founder of Ocean Gate Expeditions, Stockton Rush, who saw himself as a maverick, talking in this vlog about how the Titan defied industry standards. I'd like to be remembered as an innovator. Um, and they, I think it was General MacArthur said, you're remembered for the rules you break. And, you know, I've broken some rules to make this. I think I've broken them with, with logic and good engineering behind me, the carbon fiber and titanium. There's a rule you don't do that. Well, I did. But we're now learning more about concerns over using carbon fiber and titanium to make the experimental sub, an untested material at extreme depths over time. The Titan made 13 trips down to the Titanic over two years. This is not like being a passenger uh, on the first couple of days of service of the new Airbus A380, right? This is like being a test pilot on a plane that has never flown. Explorer Josh Gates passed on a trip to the Titanic on the sub two years ago after several of its systems failed during a test dive. Carbon fiber is a miraculous material. It's what we're using to build next generation airplanes out of, the Dreamliner, the A350, things like that. But uh, it's not particularly well understood how it works over time in terms of fatigue at depths and in extreme cold. A former Ocean Gate employee echoed those concerns in a 2018 court filing where he says he warned the company that flaws in the carbon could grow with each dive under such pressure, risking lives. The dispute was settled out of court. Tonight, with the world watching, yet another tragedy. 111 years after the Titanic's doomed voyage, five souls captivated by its story, now resting in those same waters. Gio Benitez is back with us again tonight from Nova Scotia. Gio, ABC News is now getting late word today from the Navy about when this implosion may have happened. That's right, Phil. We're talking about the Navy hearing this sound sometime in the vicinity of the Titanic around the time that the sub lost contact with the mothership. So that suggests that this all could have happened on the way down to the Titanic on Sunday, and it would have happened very, very quickly, Phil. Gio Benitez from Halifax, Nova Scotia again tonight. Gio, thank you. The Titanic had been missing at the bottom of the ocean for decades until 1985. That's when Robert Ballard located the wreckage about 400 miles off the coast of Newfoundland. A Ballard, an oceanographer and Navy officer, developed his own remotely operated underwater vehicle and turned to the Navy to fund his project. After an eight-day search, Ballard became the first person to set eyes on the Titanic April 14th. Uh, 1912 is when it uh, when it crashed. Another person closely familiar with the Titanic is director James Cameron, along with his Oscar-winning movie, of course. He's actually made 33 dives to the wreckage site itself. James and Robert, thank you both so much for joining us. We understand this is not only a difficult day because uh, for the industry, the exploring industry, but also for both of you personally, because uh, you knew uh, some of the explorers on board the submersible. Uh, and I know, first off, we're all, all thinking of their families. Um, Bob, let's start with you. What first crossed your mind when you heard the news today? I, I understand you both have a, a deeper understanding of this than most. So what was your first thought today? Well, when it happened, both Jim and I were at sea on that Sunday, and Jim called me and told me about it, and we both instantly knew that it was gone. Uh, once the, the, the data we heard that they were experiencing trouble, they were on their descent, and then when the tracking system went out and everything went out, the only way you could explain it was a catastrophic implosion. And uh, we all have not talked to anybody because we knew today would be the day when it would be confirmed. Uh, right, Jim? Yeah, uh, we didn't. I don't think we wanted to come forward. I got, as you did, Bob, approached by many outlets for comment, and it just seemed like speculation, even though we felt we knew what the outcome was going to be, and it was certainly zero surprise to me today. I was even able to visualize the wreck site in my mind over the last few days, and, and uh, you know, as described, I, I think it's exactly what we expected. But, you know, I can't imagine what these poor families have been through over the last four days, being given false hope here, banging noises, da-da-da, this and that. And, um, you know, it must have been just, uh, you know, horrible for them. And I, I, I feel so bad for them. But I also felt that, uh, as, as we agreed, Bob, that it would be insensitive to come forward with a dissenting voice to the, to the story that was uh, in motion at the time. I just wish we could have gotten an ROV to the site much, much earlier and gotten eyes on, which took four days. Um, and, you know, this thing just 
it just seemed like a, a long, a prolonged nightmare. You two well, are... French knew, the French Sorry, knew Bob. exactly where to go. And as soon as yeah. they arrived, they put their vehicle in and they dove to the spot of the last contact and dropped down and there was the wreckage. As I said, you two are so intimately familiar with this site and what it takes to get there. James, I know you were talking today. You were struck uh, by the similarity of what happened with the Titanic disaster to, you know, unfortunately, what has happened here with warnings going out beforehand. Talk to me a little bit about the irony. Well, it is. Look, people are fascinated by Titanic. They've been fascinated by that story since it sank. And yes, there's the whole, you know, all the millionaires that died and all that sort of thing. But to me, the big irony is that the Titanic sank because of bad seamanship. The captain was warned, and he took a, he took a decision to go full speed into a known ice field that was that he had Marconi gram you know telegrams in his pocket, um, warning about the ice ahead. And on a moonless night where they couldn't see anything, they just steamed full speed ahead. And I kind of feel that that's what happened here. I, I feel that this is this was such a preventable tragedy. We've never had a tragedy like this in the entire history of deep submergence, deep diving. You have these, you know, uh, um, uh, highly certified systems like Alvin at Woods Hole, which Bob is very familiar with. Uh, the, even the Russian submersibles that I that I dove with, they, every five years they had to be reclassified and, and recertified and so on. And uh, you have all these legitimate uh, deep diving operations around the world, and even most of the tourist operations around the world use certification from, let's say, ABS, the American Bureau of Shipping, and this particular outfit didn't do that. I had deep concerns about the technology that they were using, composite, uh, composite fiber uh, wound filament hull, which I don't believe has any place in deep submergence, and I know a thing or two about about you know the engineering that goes into subs i designed and built my own sub and went you know at, at uh, one point 10 years ago uh went three times deeper than titanic at the at the uh challenger deep so you know it's 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 all just engineering and these are understood and known problems the last thing somebody should be thinking about when they get into a sub to pay to go to go deep as a tourist or as a, uh, you know, what do you call it, like a lay explorer, they shouldn't have to worry about the sub that they're in. It, this is just engineering, and it's the 21st century. If you think about when, when, these, uh, when we first started diving deep back in the 60s, the time between then and now is greater than the time between Orville Wright at, uh, and Wilbur Wright at Kitty Hawk and the flight of the first 747. That's that's the amount of time that we've had to improve our understanding of material science and safety protocols and so on. There is no excuse for what happened here. And I, I find it appalling and tragic. It, just lastly, for both of you, um, I know you both knew Stockton Rush, the CEO of OceanGate. Um, uh, Bob, you've known him for 30 or so years. So if you both could just talk to me a little bit about uh, who he was, what his dream was, and what needs to happen now that this has happened. Well, he, he was a dreamer. I, I met him. He was, I met him. He was very young when I first met him, and he told me about his dream to develop uh, a technology to dive on the Titanic. Uh, but that was about it. I, I wasn't that involved at all. Uh, Jim really understands the, the engineering science uh, uh, on that particular submarine. And like, I, like Jim said, every time I dove in, Al, I've do, dove in nine different deep submersibles, and I've never worried about the integrity of the hull. Yeah, you should be worried. If you're going to Titanic, you should be worried about entanglement or some other problem. You shouldn't be worried about the basic platform that that you're that you're diving in. Uh, look, I, I didn't. I never knew Stockton well, and I had no association whatsoever with with uh, with OceanGate. But I was aware of the nature of their design, and I had been very critical of that type of design. There was a prior design uh, that was being built. It was a competing design to ours to get to Challenger Deep. Uh, back a decade ago, and I was very vocal, even to the people involved in that, saying somebody's going to get killed in a in a wound filament uh, composite hull. It's just a really, really bad idea, and we don't know. We're we're speculating right now that that was the cause of the implosion. It might have been the dome port, for all we know. 
which I've also heard was not certified to the to the depth that it was being dived to, but we don't know right now. But I, I feel pretty sure that it was that uh, it was that composite hull. But in any case, they never went through any certification process. So that to me is misrepresenting themselves to their their paying clients. And I guess one of the lessons is caveat emptor. Really look carefully. If you're going to get into a sub, look carefully at the company that designed the sub, look at its certification and all those things. I would also strongly recommend that anybody that's going to take tourists down to a deep site have an ROV on board that can reach the same depth so that they can assist if there's a if there's a problem especially entanglement which is really the greater the greater danger for any uh deep submersible that's that's operating by itself james cameron bob ballard thank you both so much i know this is a difficult day but you both have insight and have seen things with your with your own eyes that very few people in this world have so thank you both for the conversation and i know also you are both thinking about those who were lost down there and their families as we all are gentlemen thank you thank you other news tonight, there are severe weather warnings across the country after a deadly tornado outbreak. There have been 11 reported tornadoes in four states, including this double tornado. Look at this in Washington County, Colorado. But it was the tiny town of Matador, Texas that was hit the hardest. ABC's Faith Abube is there. Tonight, more powerful storms on the move. Tornado, look at it go, look at it go. A tornado touching down near Denver after a deadly 24 hours in Texas. Northeast of Lubbock, much of the small town of Matador flattened late Wednesday. A tornado claiming at least four lives. First responders and residents combing through the wreckage for anyone missing or trapped. Devana Grundy's two-story home was flattened. This morning, the reality just slapped us in the face. What was that like? I can't describe it. Can't. We have nothing. And near Denver, concert goers at the famed Red Rocks Amphitheater, assaulted by massive hailstones. Up to 90 people treated at the scene, seven taken to the hospital. Lightning from the same system, the suspected cause of this apartment complex fire in San Antonio. And straight line winds gusting to nearly 100 miles an hour in the Houston area. Hundreds of thousands losing power as those sweltering temperatures continue. And here in Matador, first responders from multiple agencies across the state are here helping with the cleanup and restoring power. The town substation was severely damaged in the storm. There's also the potential for more storms in the area, possibly severe tonight and again tomorrow. Phil? Faith Abube from Texas tonight. Now let's get right to ABC senior meteorologist Rob Marciano. And Rob, where is the greatest concern now as we head into the night? Well, similar areas, Phil, and we've already seen storms erupt in the Denver metro area just south of town, hit damaging hail and a tornado dropping there. And that's where we have a watch up uh, there across the high plains and through New Mexico and parts of Texas and Oklahoma until at least uh, 10 o'clock. So another dangerous evening ahead as those storms rumble down to the south and east and watch tomorrow. Similar spots, including uh, just south of Rapid City, we could see more in the way of severe weather. Been dealing with this stubborn system across the southeast where flooding rains have been persistent through Georgia and the Carolinas, the mid-Atlantic today. And as you you can see this thing spiraling up into the northeast more prevalent I think tomorrow and over the weekend we could even see some flooding in some spots and the tropics are hot tropical storm Brett going to make a run at St. Lucia in the next few hours tropical storm conditions it's almost at hurricane strength it should weaken as tropical depression uh, number four strengthens and then weakens we both we expect both of them and we hope that both of them uh, pitter out peter out excuse me as we get into the beginning of next week before making any sort of run at the U.S. Phil. All right, Rob Marciano, thanks. The armorer on the set of the movie Rust is facing a new charge tonight in the fatal shooting of the cinematographer. Hannah Gutierrez-Reed is now also accused of evidence tampering related to narcotics. ABC's Matt Gutman joins me now. Matt, give us the details that you know on these new charges and what they could mean for the case. First of all, Phil, this is a bombshell coming 20 months after Helena Hutchins was killed by that prop gun on the set of Rust. The details are scant, but court documents uh, just out today allege that Gutierrez Reed transferred narcotics to another person, quote, with the intent to prevent the apprehension, prosecution, and conviction of herself. It's unclear if she had narcotics on her and just tried to offload them or tried to offload the narcotics as an inducement to someone else not to get herself convicted uh, or in trouble or prosecuted. Um, 
complex and it comes very late into this case, but certainly a bombshell development so late into the case. And after the charges against of manslaughter against actor uh, Alec Baldwin were dropped just in April. And Matt, do we know how uh, Gutierrez Reed is responding to these new charges tonight? We're told that she plans to plead not guilty. Her attorney sent us a statement saying that uh, there is no evidence supporting new charge. Uh, there's also another bombshell um, piece of information that came out in these court documents released today, and that is by the prosecution's outgoing lead investigator who alleged that the sheriff's office's handling of the case is, quote, reprehensible and unprofessional. He says he had no words for how bad it was. So again, this troubled case gets even more complicated, Phil. Absolutely. All right. Matt Gutman from Los Angeles. Matt, thanks. The White House rolled out the red carpet today for a state visit from India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi. President Biden greeted Modi on the South Lawn before a meeting in the Oval Office and a press briefing in the East Room with both leaders stressing the importance of democracy and the U.S.-India relationship. The visit, though, is not without controversy. At least 70 lawmakers called on President Biden to address human rights violations in India. Still, Modi was met with applause when he addressed a joint session of Congress late this afternoon. In the past few years, there have been many advances in AI, artificial intelligence. At the same time, there have been even more momentous development in another AI, America and India. Tonight, about 400 guests are expected at the White House for a state dinner. A two-day NTSB hearing is underway in East Palestine, Ohio, as investigators try to learn more about that toxic train derailment in February. Among the revelations today, testimony from a Norfolk Southern engineer who reportedly expressed concerns about the size of the 150-car train 30 hours before more than three dozen cars toppled from the tracks but was ignored. The hearing will also looking into the initial emergency response as well as the hazardous aftermath and how it continues to affect that community. Turning to Ukraine tonight, Russia-backed officials are blaming Ukraine for striking a key bridge between the Crimean Peninsula and Ukraine, damaging a vital supply route for Russian troops in the south. And tonight, we are on the medical front lines inside a Ukrainian trauma hospital where teams are repairing horrific injuries and saving lives. ABC's chief foreign correspondent Ian Panel with the story. Tonight, as President Zelensky warns, Russia may be planning to stage an attack at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. He admits progress in Ukraine's counteroffensive has been slower than desired. Ukraine attacking in the south and east, but Russia resisting, firing tens of thousands of shells every single day. Too many have died, and for those that end up here, their fight on the battlefield is over. Now, they must fight just to stay alive. The staff at this trauma hospital have cared for thousands of wounded warriors. And day and night they come. And almost all have the same type of injuries. It's shrapnel, yes. A shrapnel in the yes, leg. Yes. The gruesome scans tell a simple and terrible story. Bullet 2%. Bullets 2% and all the rest is shrapnel. Yeah, only shrapnel. From uh, artillery, yes. mortars. Yes. Of 2,000 trauma operations this year, almost half are amputations. On this day, another young man lost his legs stepping on a Russian mine. Yeah. Jacob is an American veteran from Alaska who volunteered to fight for Ukraine, hit four days ago by shrapnel from a tank round. It's a lot of artillery, a lot of tanks, you know, sitting at like standoff distances. Dozens of badly wounded soldiers are now being brought out of the hospital. They've come in with terrible wounds. They've now been stabilized and they're being taken for further medical care. We met a crew of international medics helping evacuate patients. This is Tom from Michigan and Alan from Norway. There's severely injured patients and, um, you know, it's, it's tough to see. We don't have these types of injuries in Norway uh, or anywhere else in the West. There's torn off limbs, severe injuries that's difficult to treat. This is the cost of this war for the young men and women of Ukraine as they risk everything to liberate their land. 
One day, one hospital, and a storm that only seems to grow. Well, what a sobering scene. Now, President Putin taunting Ukraine, saying that there's been a lull in the counter-offensive. It's a claim, of course, that Ukraine will deny. But he's also saying that Ukraine has no chance to beat Russia. Phil. All right, Ian Panel from Ukraine tonight. Ian, thank you. Meantime, jail Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gerskovich will remain behind bars in Russia after losing his detention appeal. Gerskovich, as you see, stood inside a glass enclosure during his appearance in a Moscow court where he faces espionage charges for allegedly collecting Russian state secrets. The U.S. calls those accusations baseless. The judge still ordered him to remain in custody until at least the end of April. The U.S. ambassador to Russia and his parents were at the courthouse for those proceedings. There is still much more to get to here tonight on Prime. Coming up, dangerous moments at a concert when golf ball-sized hail falls onto the audience, sending people running for cover. But next, in our Prime Focus, the future of meat, raised on a farm or in a lab. Devin Dwyer with a fascinating look at how and where your next steak may come from and what it means for the environment. So you're making meat in here. Yes. But I don't see any animals and I don't see any animal parts. <laughs> well, that's the trick, right? Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine, Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. So much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. Been a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back. Tonight, we are taking a closer look at how a new way to grow the meat we eat could make a big impact on the environment. Americans ate an estimated 75 billion pounds of red meat and chicken last year alone, but what if some of that meat was not raised on farms, but in high-tech facilities instead? Scientists say it could mean fewer greenhouse gas emissions and just a fraction of the land and water used. The USDA has now given the green light for the sale of lab-grown meat to restaurants. Devin Dwyer has an inside look at the process in tonight's Prime Focus. This is what you've called a slaughterless house. Oh, yes. Yeah. The equipment looks like a commercial brewery, but it's not beer they're making. So that's where it all starts, just a few cells. It's meat. So you're making meat in here. Yes. But I don't see any animals and I don't see any animal parts. <laughs> well, that's the trick, right? Stainless steel bioreactors or cultivators produce real meat from animal stem cells. You're making chicken in there. Yeah, so if you look at this, this is a approximately a 200 plus liter tank. And we take cells from a chicken or an egg. Dr. Uma Valetti is a cardiologist who founded Upside Foods, taking on a food chain as old as time. It takes two weeks to grow the equivalent of one chicken, a thousand chickens or a hundred thousand chickens. So you're saying in this factory, you can make more meat faster and cleaner 
than an average farmer. Well, ultimately, yes. We saw how cells kept on ice can be replicated on a large scale, fed a mixture of vitamins, fats, sugars, and oxygen in tanks, growing into tissues of chicken. Is it safe? Absolutely. The best indication for this is two months ago, we are the first company in the world to get FDA green light to bring cultivated chicken to the market. For decades, scientists have pursued growing meat from cells as a way to protect animals and feed a booming global population. The demand for meat is continuing to grow and double and double, and we just don't have enough resources nor ability to continue to grow that much meat. The environmental benefits could be even bigger. Animal farming requires vast amounts of land and water, and the animals, especially cows, are a major source of greenhouse gas emissions, 15% of the total worldwide. Farmed beef generally has some of the highest environmental impacts among most foods. So if that's your point of reference, almost anything including cultivated meat, will look more sustainable by comparison. Rachel Santo at Johns Hopkins University says the potential is tantalizing. There's been a growing body of research showing that our dietary choices are a major contributor to climate change and that by changing and shifting how we eat foods, we can help address climate change. That prospect has attracted top-tier investors like Bill Gates, Richard Branson, and Whole Foods founder John Mackey. President Biden signed an executive order this year requiring federal agencies to support cultivating alternative food sources. And recently, Upside became the first company to receive final USDA label approval using the term cell cultivated meat. Are we at a watershed moment? How big of a deal is the rise of cultivated meat? How are you going to make an impact in the environment if you cannot scale this as a reasonable cost? Some experts, like Ricardo San Martin at UC Berkeley's Alternative Meat Lab, say cultivated meat is no silver bullet. People love their meat. It's People the love their us. meat. So, so this is the most complicated country to tackle the problem. Americans are among the world's top meat eaters, and enticing them to cut consumption has proven to be challenging. Cattle ranchers like Todd Wilkinson say there are major socioeconomic implications too. What the cattle industry has done is become more efficient and we've reduced our footprint across uh, the U.S. considerably, but we produce more beef. Do you see cultivated meat as a threat to the cattle industry? I see it as a threat if it's mislabeled. So what should it be labeled? Cultured meat, lab grown, uh, something that just stands out and lets the consumer know what they're eating. And while cultivated meat likely means a smaller carbon footprint, some experts say more study is needed. More research and just caution. I, I think that a lot of companies are going to use or present the best case scenarios. Cultivated meat could be part of the solution, but it's not necessarily the only solution. And then, will consumers even like the taste? Today we're cooking our upside chicken filet, and we'll be serving that with a white wine butter sauce and pan-roasted vegetables. Can you smell it yet? I can smell it. It, it smells like chicken. And you have to slice it. It's not a plant-based piece. All right, my first bite of cultivated meat. It's chicken. Cultivated chicken could soon be on restaurant menus in California and then possibly store shelves for a premium price in a few years. What makes you so confident people will buy it? People are buying meat right now, despite how it's made. What if we can make the process more kinder, caring, healthier, nutritious? I believe nearly everybody will get behind it. Our thanks to Devin Dwyer for that. There is still much more to get to here on Prime. Coming up, a water rights dispute goes all the way to the Supreme Court. How justice has decided on a tribe's fight to have the federal government help supply their water. But next, e-cigarette sales have spiked in the past few years. We take a look at the state of vaping by the numbers. Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live.
the crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. You're along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. I came out of jail with a plan. I was going to put every piece of energy I had into music. Give it up for Jelly Roll! If I wasn't a musician, I'd be dead. This was my best bet to really have an impact. <laughs> I'll cry with you. Who would have thought I could help people? I needed help, you know? I still need help. Somebody say me. I love you. With so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. At a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on. Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. Always. Absolutely. That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby. It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings, a new podcast from ABC Audio. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. There is plenty of evidence that public health campaigns to quit smoking helped curb the addiction. But according to a CDC report released today, Americans are still finding ways to get their nicotine fix. Here's the state of vaping by the numbers. E-cigarette sales have climbed 47% from the start of 2020 to the end of 2022, with about 23 million units sold monthly. At the same time, there has been a spike in brands with 184 just three years ago, 269 to choose from now. Now, younger users are driving that popularity. In 2021, about 5% of adults 18 plus reported vaping, narrowing that focus to Gen Z, the 18 to 24 year olds, and that number climbs to 11%. And last year, 14% of high school students, about 2 million kids, said they were using e cigarettes. The study also found a surge in fruit and candy flavors like bubble gum and blue raspberry, which jumped from 29% of sales to 41% during that same period. And while the use of pre-filled vape cartridges is declining, disposable e-cigarettes have nearly doubled, now making up 52% of the business. But there are signs that new vaping regulations are working. Sales were actually down 12% during the final six months of that study. What is clear is the CDC will be keeping a very close eye on where the trends go next. 
There is much more ahead here on Prime. Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg in a cage match. The Twitter back and forth that is causing some speculation. And as hip hop turns 50, we are taking a look at its impact and its most groundbreaking artists like Magnolia Shorty, how she became one of the biggest voices in New Orleans music. It was literally like she came in like a tornado, did the songs and left. And I was just like, whoa, what just happened? We literally just did an EP, like in maybe an hour. What does it take to be America's number one news? It takes asking the straightforward, tough questions. Do you believe that Donald Trump should ever be president again? How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? The newsmaking interviews. You said that there were six friends. One of them was sick. Yeah. Do you have future political aspirations? Going to the front line. The search for survivors. How does this war end? And getting to the heart of the story. Thank you for being here. We'll be here for the long run. ABC News, number one in the morning. The number one newscast. Number one in daytime talk. Friday nights, Sunday mornings versus the competition. And the number one streaming news. Thank you for making ABC News America's trusted, straightforward first choice. With so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. At a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners. And the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings, a new podcast from ABC Audio. Listen now, wherever you get your podcasts. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsey Davis. Injured when golf ball size hail pelts a famed amphitheater. New details on who paid for Congressman George Santos's bond. And Elon Musk challenges another billionaire to a cage match. These stories and more in tonight's rundown. Concert goers at Red Rocks Amphitheater outside Denver were hit with severe hail. Nearly 100 people hurt, seven sent to the hospital. Injuries included cuts, broken bones, and some non-life-threatening injuries. The severe weather also forcing them to postpone that night's concert featuring Lewis Tomlinson. Singer later tweeting he hoped everyone was okay and was sending everyone love. A narrowly divided Supreme Court ruled against Navajo Nation in a Colorado River water rights case. In a 5-4 to four decision, the court said the Navajo Nation could not sue to force the federal government to help expand their access to water. That case involved a treaty the tribe said required the government to assess and plan to meet their water needs. But the majority opinion said the treaty did not require the government to take affirmative steps to provide water for the tribe. That decision comes as water is increasingly scarce across the West particularly the Colorado River Basin, and when one-third of Navajo Nation homes lack running water. 
It was George Santos' father and aunt who guaranteed his $500,000 bond. The unsealed court document names them as Jersino Santos and Elma Santos Preven. George Santos posted bond after pleading not guilty to a 13-count indictment accusing him of fraud, money laundering, and theft of public funds. Santos' attorney previously said Santos preferred to go to jail rather than name his bail backers. The Utah mother accused of murdering her husband and then writing a children's book about dealing with grief was back in court today for a brief scheduling conference. The hearing came days after Corey Richens filed a lawsuit against her late husband Eric's estate, worth nearly $2 million, claiming she's entitled to money and assets through their prenuptial agreement. Authorities say Richens murdered her husband by lacing his drink with a fatal dose of fentanyl in March 2022. Prosecutors and Eric's family believe Richens was financially motivated to kill him, which she denies. Are we in for a battle of the tech billionaires? In a back and forth on social media, Twitter head Elon Musk and Meta chief Mark Zuckerberg appeared to agree to a cage match fight. Chatter of the match began after Musk responded to a report about Meta coming out with a feature similar to Twitter threads. When a Twitter user replied about Zuckerberg doing jujitsu, Musk replied that he was up for a cage match, if Zuckerberg was. Zuckerberg then posted an Instagram story including Musk's tweet with a response, send me location. Musk responded that if Zuckerberg's challenge was for real, he would do it. Not clear when this match would take place or if it even will. The John F. Kennedy Center for Performing Arts has revealed its latest group of honorees. Billy Crystal, Queen Latifah, Dionne Warwick, Barry Gibb, and Renee Fleming will round out this year's group. In a statement, Kennedy Center President Deborah Rutter called the group an extraordinary mix of individuals. She added that this year's ceremony would also pay tribute to the 50th anniversary of hip hop and that it was an honor to celebrate Latifah, the so-called first lady of hip hop. The group will be honored at a ceremony hosted by Gloria Estefan at the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C., which will take place in December. Now to a look at how thieves are using artificial intelligence to fool people into thinking a loved one is either asking for a loan or is in physical danger. ABC's Wick Johnson with the details. Please send the money. This is for real. That may sound like me, but it's not. It's a voice fake generated by artificial intelligence. And with the rise of AI, victims across the country tell us kidnapping scams are becoming increasingly believable and terrifying. I get a phone call and it's my daughter's voice and Bree says, mom, and she's crying and sobbing. I never doubted it was her. So we asked Pete Nicoletti of Checkpoint Technologies, one of the largest cybersecurity firms, to explain how this rapidly evolving tech is changing the game for scammers and their victims. To start, he shows us some of the basics of AI's capabilities using content pulled directly from my social media. You actually pulled some photographs of me out on a breaking news scene. So here you are, this is Mississippi, in front of a terrible tornado. But with artificial intelligence, you can just say, hey, I want to put wit in front of Canadian wildfires. This AI tool is so advanced that it adds a shadow. I could see you found my headshot. Wow. It's very realistic. The AI can create almost any scenario, as long as you have the basics to work with. Just your face. Next, we wanted to hear what the team at Checkpoint could do using AI with just a 10-minute sample of my voice. Take a listen. This is not a real call. I just went out to lunch with the crew and my company credit card is not working. Sending you a link to pay back the guy that covered me. Now this would come in as a voice message and the criminals can easily impersonate your phone number so it says wit sell. Now, what if scammers tried to convince my family members that I'd been kidnapped? To be clear, this is a voice fake example. Listen. My love, it is me, Wit. Please, please listen carefully. I have been abducted and am being held in a basement, tied up in the dark. Please follow their instructions. Do not notify the authorities. You look wow. scared, Wit. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, I am. You, that's very believable. These scammers now can have a conversation with you in real time. There's tools where you can actually type it in and, and use your voice. Again, the audio you're about to hear is not real. 
Please send the money. This is for real. They are asking me to say the date of life. It's June 14th. Please send the money now. The AI can actually adjust the inflection in yes. my voice. Absolutely. We don't have any recordings of you under stress, but I can change your voice to where you're now stressed. Nicoletti says all family members should adopt a safe word that can be used when trying to communicate with a loved one who has supposedly been kidnapped. Rich Frankel, a former FBI special agent, says this kind of cyber crime is hard to stop. He recommends recording any type of suspicious call, then trying to reach your loved one directly. I would call law enforcement right away because if it is a real kidnapping, you want law enforcement involved. And if it's a scam, you want to know about it right away. It's a frightening prospect. Wick Johnson, thank you for that. And for half a century, hip-hop has changed the landscape of the music industry. As part of our Hip Hop at 50 series, we dive into the history of bounce music in New Orleans and one pioneer whose impact can still be felt today. ABC's Megan Wright is in the Big Easy with the story of the queen of bounce, Magnolia Shorty. Music is fast, high tempo. It's more of a, a gospel feeling to me. You have no choice but to move and dance. It brings joy. Like bouncing music in New Orleans, oh my God. You about to do it, do it, do, do, do it, do it. She about to shake it, shake it. Bounce, baby, bounce, baby, bounce, 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 baby, bounce. Ra, got your wiggle, bust it, bust it with your wiggle. Ra, got your wiggle, booty, bust it. In New Orleans, if you don't have bounce, your party's boring. It's energy. That's what bounce is. That's what twerk is. It's a New Orleans thing, and it's our culture, and we love it. If you think they cute, look at them and say, hey, <laughs> From Josephine to Melphamine to Calio to Magno to Second and D, PNC, 30G, STP, IVP, Wild of Feet, Dirty D, CTC, DNG. That's what people know about bounce mix. It's fun. It's going to make you dance. It's going to represent your hood. <laughs> Influenced by the early rap music surging around the country in the late 80s, bounce music emerged out of the streets of New Orleans. And during that time, you had other artists that was coming out. DJ Jimmy, Juvenile, Jubilee, Lady Red, Josephine, Johnny, Kilo, Lil Slim, BG, UNLV. New Orleans began to create their own sound. But there's one artist that's considered the queen of bounce. The late, great Magnolia Shorty. Magnolia Shorty. Magnolia Shorty. <laughs> Magnolia Shorty's raw, uncut, in-your-face lyrics setting her apart from the rest. Money, 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 money. Before Renetta Lowe was discovered by Cash Money Records CEO Birdman and given the name Magnolia Shorty by the late No Limit rapper Soulja Slim, she was just a kid rapping in the infamous Magnolia Projects. She knew she was a star at a young age. She was destined for starting just by her personality, you know, and her confidence. <laughs> Her first hit, Monkey on a Stick, catapulted her to the top of the New Orleans bounce scene. Sound like they, it's kind of promiscuous. It sounded like I heard them say something about, you know, having sexual activities and stuff. And she was like, no, Renee, I'm going to let you listen to the song. It's saying what the other girls told me. When she did the songs, I was like, wow, who is that little girl mama? <laughs> you know, I was like, but, you know, you, you can't tell nobody nothing. I was in a shopping mall with her, and people were saying, oh, look at Magnolia Shorty. And I was like, I said, Renetta, all the people talking about, look at Magnolia Shorty. I said, who is Magnolia Shorty? She was like, that's me, Renetta, that's me. Those are my fans. I said, girl, go ahead on. You got fans? Like, I'm like, Michael Jackson got fans. Before long, Magnolia Shorty was working with New Orleans' top music makers like Manny Fresh. It was literally like she came in like a tornado, did the songs, and left. And I was just like, whoa, what just happened? We literally just did an EP, like in maybe an hour. Everything that I put up, she was like, oh, I know what I'm doing to that. And she had these girls behind her, like cheerleaders, just cheering her on. Like, and I was like, okay, you've been waiting to do this all your life. I could tell. She became the first female rapper signed to Cash Money Records, later known for launching one of today's biggest rappers, Lil Wayne. In 1997, Magnolia Shorty released her debut album, Monkey on a Stick, now considered a bounce classic. And she was featured on Juvenile's Third Ward Soldier. People used to jump on the mic before she get on the mic because when she get on it, it's over. 
She shut the whole club down. It's over. She was a pioneer because she was original. She was authentic. She was a real one that held it down for New Orleans and for the Magnolia Project. While Magnolia Shorty was making her mark in the Crescent City, there were others making history too, like Katie Red, the first transgender bounce artist. What was your relationship like with Magnolia Shorty? We was on the mic microphone together and DJ Jubilee recorded us. So it was the Jubilee song. <laughs> Bounce was thriving in the new millennium. But then in 2005... Katrina. 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 Absolute devastation. There is water everywhere. The devastation of Hurricane Katrina left thousands of residents displaced. Katrina with New Orleans is the gift and the curse. Because Bounce kind of got watered down, too. But after Katrina, a lot of people came back different because, you know, they, they, they start picking up habits from different places and start talking different, and everything kind of changed. After Katrina, residents relocated to places like Houston and Atlanta, bringing the culture and influence of bounce music with them. Yo, yo, yo. By 2010, Magnolia Shorty had solidified herself as a bounce legend at age 28. My daughter calls me. Ma, they said somebody got shot in the Georgetown apartments where she stayed. When I got in the car, I was like, Lord, whatever's going on, Lord, please just please prepare me. So we pulled out and we saw the, the police and the man just looked up at me. He said, she gone. On December 20th, 2010, Magnolia Shorty was returning to her apartment when she was shot and killed. The bullets reportedly meant for the man in the car with her. Five gang members were convicted in connection to the murders, according to the New Orleans Advocate. And I just collapsed. I cried, and I didn't want to get up when they tried to get me up, because as long as I was on the ground, it felt like it was all a dream. You mentioned the moment when you realized that your sister was a star. You're not only grieving as a sister, how do you deal with that when you're like, OK, my sister is gone, but now I'm looking around, and it's also impacting the city? And then um, it actually helped me through my grief, you know, to know, you know, people have s such good words to say about her and nice things and the encouragement that this city gave me and the support that they gave me towards my little sister. She had a good spirit and a good soul, and she just loved what she do, too. You know, she loved her music. Magnolia's influence on bounce music and hip-hop culture has never been lost. The young girl from the Magnolia Projects who rose to the top of her city in the height of her industry can still be felt and heard today. You can hear it in Magnolia Shorty's version of Smoking Gun, sampled in Drake's In My Feelings. I got a new boy in a Drake. And the powerful influence she created by paving a lane and opening doors for all Bounce artists to thrive. They're doing it worldwide now. Everybody want a little piece of Bounce. Everybody is bouncing. Over 30 years since its creation, both Bounce music and culture are here to stay. And although the city of New Orleans is happy to share, just make sure you give them their props. And a lasting legacy as well. Our thanks to Megan Wright. And that's our show for this hour. I'm Phil Lipoff. Stay with ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks for streaming with us. Coming up in the next hour, an investigation in China after a gas explosion kills 31 people. The action the government is now taking. And flying from South Carolina to New York City for an internship? Why this student chose the long commute over renting a place in the city. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. Where can you get the best, most delicious, most mouth-watering breakfast in America? Next week, GMA's out across the country as some of the best breakfast spots in America compete in GMA's United States of Breakfast. So, will we be at your favorite breakfast place? 
This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. Always. Absolutely. That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby. It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings, a new podcast from ABC Audio. Listen now, wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Good evening. I'm Phil Lipoff in for Lindsay Davis tonight. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We begin with the grim discovery near the wreckage of the Titanic, a tragic end to a story that captivated the world this week. The Coast Guard announcing today pieces of the Titan submersible had been found near the wreckage of the Titanic and the five aboard were likely lost in a catastrophic implosion. The families of the passengers were immediately informed their loved ones were presumed dead. It ended a days-long search where rescuers in the world had held out hope we did learn late today the Navy heard the sound of that implosion on Sunday. Gio Benitez leads us off once again tonight from Halifax, Nova Scotia. Tonight, a heartbreaking end. The Coast Guard announcing search crews have found the pieces of the missing sub carrying five passengers 1,600 feet, nearly a third of a mile from the bow of the Titanic. This is a incredibly unforgiving uh, environment down there uh, on the seafloor. Uh, and uh, the debris is consistent with a catastrophic uh, implosion of uh, the vessel. Five major pieces of debris were recovered on the ocean floor, including the sub's nose cone, as well as the front and back end of the vessel, all coming apart as the capsule collapsed inward under extreme pressure. It's unclear exactly when the sub imploded after it started its dive Sunday morning. The Navy now saying an underwater acoustic detection system heard what was likely the implosion of the Titan on Sunday. The information was immediately shared with the Coast Guard for analysis. On behalf of the United States Coast Guard and the entire Unified Command, I offer my deepest condolences to the families. Ocean Gate Expeditions tonight saying our hearts are with these five souls and every member of their families during this tragic time. We grieve the loss of life and joy they brought to everyone they knew. Businessman Shazada Dawood and his 19-year-old son Suleiman, who shared a passion for science and discovery. British billionaire and explorer Hamish Harding, who loved adventure. Voyaging to space aboard a Blue Origin flight. 
I've always wanted to do this, and the, the sheer experience of looking out of the window is something I'm looking forward to. And setting records, diving to the world's deepest waters in the Pacific. Well, it's been a fantastic dive. Tonight, Harding's family remembering him as a loving husband and dedicated father, calling him a passionate explorer, whatever the terrain, who lived for his family, his business, and for the next adventure. P.H. Narjulet, a legendary expert on the Titanic, had been to the wreck more than 30 times since it was discovered. His daughter today saying there is comfort in knowing he was in the place he so loved. And the CEO and founder of Ocean Gate Expeditions, Stockton Rush, who saw himself as a maverick, talking in this vlog about how the Titan defied industry standards. I'd like to be remembered as an innovator. Um, I think it was General MacArthur said, you're remembered for the rules you break. And, you know, I've broken some rules to make this. I think I've broken them with, with logic and good engineering behind me, the carbon fiber and titanium. There's a rule you don't do that. Well, I did. But we're now learning more about concerns over using carbon fiber and titanium to make the experimental sub, an untested material at extreme depths over time. The Titan made 13 trips down to the Titanic over two years. This is not like being a passenger uh, on the first couple of days of service of the new Airbus A380, right? This is like being a test pilot on a plane that has never flown. Explorer Josh Gates passed on a trip to the Titanic on the sub two years ago after several of its systems failed during a test dive. Carbon fiber is a miraculous material. It's what we're using to build next generation airplanes out of, the Dreamliner, the A350, things like that. But uh, it's not particularly well understood how it works over time in terms of fatigue at depths and in extreme cold. A former Ocean Gate employee echoed those concerns in a 2018 court filing where he says he warned the company that flaws in the carbon could grow with each dive under such pressure, risking lives. The dispute was settled out of court. Tonight, with the world watching, yet another tragedy, 111 years after the Titanic's doomed voyage, five souls captivated by its story, now resting in those same waters. Gio Benitez from Halifax, Nova Scotia. Gio, thank you. The Titanic had been missing at the bottom of the ocean for decades until 1985. That's when Robert Ballard located the wreckage about 400 miles off the coast of Newfoundland. A Ballard, an oceanographer and Navy officer, developed his own remotely operated underwater vehicle and turned to the Navy to fund his project. After an eight-day search, Ballard became the first person to set eyes on the Titanic April 14th. Uh, 1912 is when it uh, when it crashed. Another person closely familiar with the Titanic is director James Cameron, along with his Oscar-winning movie, of course. He's actually made 33 dives to the wreckage site itself. James and Robert, thank you both so much for joining us. We understand this is not only a difficult day because uh, for the industry, the exploring industry, but also for both of you personally because uh, you knew uh, some of the explorers on board the submersible. Uh, and I know first off, we're all, all thinking of their families. Um, Bob, let's start with you. What first crossed your mind when you heard the news today? I, I understand you both have a, a deeper understanding of this than most. So what was your first thought today? Well, when it happened, both Jim and I were at sea on that Sunday, and Jim called me and told me about it, and we both instantly knew that it was gone. Uh, once the, the, the data we heard that they were experiencing trouble, they were on their descent, and then when the tracking system went out and everything went out, the only way you could explain it was a catastrophic implosion. And uh, we all have not talked to anybody because we knew today would be the day when it would be confirmed. Uh, right, Jim? Yeah, uh, we didn't, I don't think we wanted to come forward. I got, as you did, Bob, approached by many outlets for comment, and it just seemed like speculation, even though we felt we knew what the outcome was going to be, and it was certainly zero surprise to me today. I was even able to visualize the wreck site in my mind over the last few days, and, and uh, you know, as described, I, I think it's exactly what we expected. But, you know, I can't imagine what these poor families have been through over the last four days, being given false hope here, banging noises, da-da-da, this and that. And, um, you know, it must have been just, uh, you know, horrible for them. And I, I, I feel so bad for them. But I also felt that, uh, as, as we agreed, Bob, that it would be insensitive to come forward with a dissenting voice to the, to the story that was uh, in motion at the time. I just wish we could have gotten an ROV to the site much, much earlier 
and gotten eyes on, which, which took four days. Um, and, you know, this thing just it just seemed like a, a long, a prolonged nightmare. You two well, are... French knew, the French Sorry, knew exactly where to go. Uh, as soon as yeah. they arrived, they put their vehicle in and they dove to the spot of the last contact and dropped down and there was the wreckage. As I said, you two are so intimately familiar with this site and what it takes to get there. James, I know you were talking today, you were struck uh, by the similarity of what happened with the Titanic disaster to, you know, unfortunately what has happened here with warnings going out beforehand. Talk to me a little bit about the irony. Well, it is, look, people are fascinated by Titanic. They've been fascinated by that story since it sank. And yes, there's the whole, you know, all the millionaires that died and all that sort of thing. But to me, the big irony is that the Titanic sank because of bad seamanship. The captain was warned, and he took a, he took a decision to go full speed into a known ice field that was that he had Marconi gram you know telegrams in his pocket, um, warning about the ice ahead. And on a moonless night where they couldn't see anything, they just steamed full speed ahead. And I kind of feel that that's what happened here. I, I feel that this is this was such a preventable tragedy. We've never had a tragedy like this in the entire history of deep submergence, deep diving. You have these, you know, uh, um, uh, highly certified systems like Alvin at Woods Hole, which Bob is very familiar with. Uh, the, even the Russian submersibles that I that I dove with, they, every five years they had to be reclassified and, and recertified and so on. And uh, you have all these legitimate uh, deep diving operations around the world, and even most of the tourist operations around the world use certification from, let's say, ABS, the American Bureau of Shipping, and this particular outfit didn't do that. I had deep concerns about the technology that they were using, composite, uh, composite fiber uh, wound filament hull, which I don't believe has any place in deep submergence, and I know a thing or two about about you know the engineering that goes into subs i designed and built my own sub and went you know at, at uh, one point 10 years ago uh went three times deeper than titanic at the at the uh challenger deep so you know it's 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 all just engineering and these are understood and known problems the last thing somebody should be thinking about when they get into a sub to pay to go to go deep as a tourist or as a, uh, you know, what do you call it, like a lay explorer, they shouldn't have to worry about the sub that they're in. It, this is just engineering, and it's the 21st century. If you think about when, when, these, uh, when we first started diving deep back in the 60s, the time between then and now is greater than the time between Orville Wright at, uh, and Wilbur Wright at Kitty Hawk and the flight of the first 747. That's, that's the amount of time that we've had to improve our understanding of material science and safety protocols and so on. There is no excuse for what happened here, and I, I find it appalling and tragic. It, just lastly, for both of you, um, I know you both knew Stockton Rush, the CEO of OceanGate. Um, uh, Bob, you've known him for 30 or so years, so if you both could just talk to me a little bit about uh, who he was, what his dream was, and what needs to happen now that this has happened. Well, he, he was a dreamer. I, I met him. He was, was, I met him. He was very young when I first met him, and he told me about his dream to develop uh, a technology to dive on the Titanic. Uh, but that was about it. I, I wasn't that involved at all. Uh, Jim really understands the, the engineering science uh, uh, on that particular submarine. And like, I, like Jim said, every time I dove in, Al, I've do, dove in nine different deep submersibles, and I've never worried about the integrity of the hull. Yeah, you should be worried. If you're going to Titanic, you should be worried about entanglement or some other problem. You shouldn't be worried about the basic platform that that you're that you're diving in. Um, look, I, I didn't. I never knew Stockton well, and I had no association whatsoever with with uh, with OceanGate. But I was aware of the nature of their design, and I had been very critical of that type of design. There was a prior design uh, that was being built. It was a competing design to ours to get to Challenger Deep. Uh, back a decade ago, and I was very vocal, even to the people involved in that, saying somebody's going to get killed in a in a wound filament uh, composite hull. It's just a really, really bad idea. 
And we don't know, we're, we're speculating right now that that was the cause of the implosion. It might have been the dome port, for all we know, uh, which I've also heard was not certified to the, to the depth that it was being dived to. But we don't know right now. But I, I feel pretty sure that it was that, uh, it was that composite hull. But in any case, they never went through any certification process. So that, to me, is misrepresenting themselves to their, their paying clients. And I guess one of the lessons is caveat emptor. Really look carefully. If you're going to get into a sub, look carefully at the company that designed the sub, look at its certification and all those things. I would also strongly recommend that anybody that's going to take tourists down to a deep site have an ROV on board that can reach the same depth so that they can assist if there's a if there's a problem especially entanglement which is really the greater the greater danger for any uh deep submersible that's that's operating by itself james cameron bob ballard thank you both so much i know this is a difficult day but you both have insight and have seen things with your with your own eyes that very few people in this world have so thank you both for the conversation and i know also you are both thinking about those who were lost down there and their families as we all are gentlemen thank you thank you other news this evening, there are severe weather warnings across the country tonight after a deadly tornado outbreak. There have been 11 reported tornadoes in four states, including this. Take a look at this. This is a double tornado in Washington County, Colorado. But it was the tiny town of Matador, Texas, that was hit the hardest. And ABC's Faith Abube is there. Tonight, more powerful storms on the move. Tornado, look at it go! Look at it go! A tornado touching down near Denver after a deadly 24 hours in Texas. Northeast of Lubbock, much of the small town of Matador flattened late Wednesday. A tornado claiming at least four lives. First responders and residents combing through the wreckage for anyone missing or trapped. Devana Grundy's two-story home was flattened. This morning, the reality just slapped us in the face. What was that like? I can't describe it. <laughs> can't. We have nothing. <laughs> And near Denver, concert goers at the famed Red Rocks Amphitheater, assaulted by massive hailstones. Up to 90 people treated at the scene, seven taken to the hospital. Lightning from the same system, the suspected cause of this apartment complex fire in San Antonio. And straight line winds gusting to nearly 100 miles an hour in the Houston area. Hundreds of thousands losing power as those sweltering temperatures continue. Faith Abube from Matador, Texas. Faith, thank you. There is still much more to get to here tonight. Coming up, a young chef highlighting his passion for cooking on TikTok and in a new cookbook. But next, the investigation underway after a deadly gas explosion at a restaurant in China. We'll have the latest. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? 
Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Reporting from Manhattan, I'm Diane Macedo. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. We are tracking several headlines around the world right now. More than 225 migrants were rescued at sea near Spain's Canary Islands after departing on boats from the West Africa coastline. Summer is the busiest time of year for attempted crossings. In 2022, more than 550 migrants died trying to get to the Canary Islands. To China, where the investigation is underway after this gas explosion at a barbecue restaurant in the city of Yinchan killed 31 people just ahead of the holiday weekend. Chinese President Xi Jinping immediately ordered a national safety campaign to crack down on industrial accidents. The blast came as the city prepared for the annual Dragon Boat Festival. And in Northeast India, lives and livestock are at risk. Tens of thousands of residents have been forced to flee their homes amid devastating flooding with heavy monsoons causing rivers to swell. More heavy rain, by the way, is expected in the days ahead. His style in the kitchen has earned him a finalist spot on MasterChef and 11 million followers on TikTok. In our latest edition of TikTok, where we take a closer look at the story behind the social media sensation, we highlight Nick DiGiovanni, his passion for cooking, his quick recipe tricks, and his debut cookbook, Creative Recipes Anyone Can Cook. Our Will Gann sat down with the young chef and has his story. When he's not whipping up dishes in the kitchen, viral 27-year-old chef Nick DiGiovanni is spicing up his TikTok feed with instructional cooking videos. And into a cast iron with some Alfredo sauce, crab, green onions, and mozzarella cheese. Spilling the beans on all things food related, the Rhode Island native makes cooking look as easy as pie. Let's make thousand layer potatoes. And he's been sharing his cooking creations for quite some time. Tell us about the first cookbook you ever wrote. The first cookbook I still have, believe it or not, thanks to my mom for saving all those little childhood memories that I always ask to throw away. I wrote it when I was seven, and it really, I didn't write much, actually. It's a green binder, and it's just filled with recipes that I printed off the internet. An exciting start of a dream for Nick that turned into a reality all these years later, this time featuring his own recipes in his latest cookbook, Knife Drop, creative recipes anyone can cook. I really do believe that anyone can cook. That's why I have the motto on the top of the book. Cooking is all relative. Cooking can mean anything to a certain extent, but I really do believe that anyone, no matter what your age is, can jump into a kitchen and make something exciting too. Pour in one pan San Marzano tomatoes and break them into chunks. Finish with a pinch of salt and a few shredded basil leaves and let it simmer for at least 10 minutes. How do you gain such knowledge of so many different types of cuisines? It started with family. I had a Persian grandfather. I have an aunt who's Indian. My dad's family cooked a lot of Italian cuisine. I was lucky. I had it all in terms of that worldwide depth and knowledge of food. I was taught as a young kid to try everything when it came to food at least once. Putting his cooking ability to the test, this Harvard graduate decided to take on Master Chef season 10 at just 22 years old. Nick, you better start thinking about what you're doing, young man, okay? Let's go, use that Harvard education. There's no good way to describe the feeling of going the first day and being in the MasterChef kitchen. I took away from it the idea of fearlessness and just, when I go into a kitchen now, and ever since I went on that show, I feel like I just, I try to forget about everything and I just have fun and I try to get creative. Since becoming one of the youngest finalists ever on the show, he's worked with celebrity chefs, even beating a world record with his mentor, Gordon Ramsay. Congratulations, yes! you're officially amazing. And when he's not crushing it online, racking up over 20 million followers across social media. My favorite thing in the world, truly, is when there's a kid, you know, a, a couple feet off the ground. <laughs> that comes up and has seen a video and has been excited or inspired by it. 
Anyone that's that young of an age, I am sometimes baffled that they enjoy food and cooking videos. He's sharing advice for cooks in training. I would say the best place to start would be start at the front of the book, mm -hmm. learn those fundamentals, and get a solid grasp of those, and then use the rest of the book as a guide. Coat them in duck fat. And a pinch of truffle salt. Then stack them all up. Then bake until tender. But even chefs need to rest. Yeah, yes and no. <laughs> uh -huh. Sometimes Thanksgiving and holidays, that's my one day off a year, which sounds crazy. But that's the time that I don't want to cook in, mm -hmm. in some ways. I always end up getting roped into it. And my mom, if she starts panicking and things get crazy, <laughs> she'll call me in. We've run into a few situations, I'll, I'll be honest, of too many cooks in the kitchen. <laughs> Just, I, I, don't, I don't sometimes, I, it, it doesn't sometimes work out with if she's too stressed and, and I'm trying to. So there's been some tension once in a while, in a funny way. Right. But weirdly, it's, it's, it's one of my few days off for the entire year. I love that. You probably do deserve maybe a Thanksgiving off every now and then. It's tough because, you know, you're sort of peeking from the side and then you see something <laughs> going wrong with the turkey. And it's, it's in right. my head, do I step in or do I just let it happen uh -huh. and deal with a slightly drier turkey on the table? It's a tough thing. Yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a predicament that, that I've been put in a few times. And whether you're a master chef or you're looking to sharpen your cooking skills, Nick says his new book is for everyone. I like to cook in a way where you sort of forget about reading a recipe and just have fun. I want you to use this book to become comfortable enough in the kitchen that you know the rules, then can break the rules and just forget about any guide. Our thanks to Will Gans, and you can buy Knife Drop Creative Recipes. Anyone can cook anywhere books are sold. Is still to come, the college student going the extra mile, or miles, for her summer internship. Will Reeve has the story of her South Carolina to New Jersey super commute when we come back. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings, a new podcast from ABC Audio. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go, you ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching? Watching Saturdays on ABC News Live. What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Back now with the summer intern who is keeping her costs down by commuting by plane to her internship in New Jersey, saying it's cheaper than paying rent. Will Reeve has her story. Good morning. It is 3.45 a.m. We are going to get ready to commute. Sophia Celentano has gotten used to waking up early. You might be wondering, Sophia, if you're working 9 to 5, why are you up at 3 a.m.? Once a week, she likes to take the long way to work. I decided that it would be better for me to commute by plane. That's right. The 21-year-old South Carolina native boards a plane from her home in Charleston to her internship in Parsippany, New Jersey, where her employer requires her to be in the office one day a week. But instead of packing up and moving for the summer, she makes the roughly two-hour flight. 7.15, we landed in Newark early again. I looked at places that were in the suburbs of New Jersey. I looked at places that were in New York City and got absolutely terrified <laughs> with the rent prices. Rent in New York City is currently at record highs. In May, the median price of a studio apartment was roughly $3,200. 
while a studio in Parsippany is averaging nearly 2000 So a typical flight round trip from Charleston to Newark costs around $100. Those Ubers, my one in the morning that I take by myself is usually between 55 to 75 and I carpool with my coworkers after work, so that's a $10 Uber, and then the train is around $11. Add in an extra 25 bucks for food, and Celentano says she spends about $225 a week on commuting. She estimates she'll spend just over $2,200 over the course of her 10-week-long internship, saving her at least $2,000 this summer. That's it for my super commute. Good night, America. That's a big savings, Will Reeve. Thanks so much. And that's our show for tonight. I'm Phil Lipoff. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news context and analysis. And you can always find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and of course, abcnews.com. Good night. This is ABC News Live. To crush the families here.